Psalm 51, verse 17 tonight, uh, a verse that you've heard many times perhaps. The psalmist wrote these words. He said, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Everybody say broken. broken. I want to talk to you about being broken, but maybe not in the sense that you would think. Uh, when we say broken, uh, we often think of somebody that's really hurting, and that's a good sense of that word, and I think that's one of the major ways in which the psalmist means it in that verse. But I want to talk to you on this subject tonight, uh, broken, how to have a ministry. Everybody that is born again into the kingdom of God, God equips them to do something that matters for the kingdom of God. You may never stand in a pulpit, thank God, it would be an awful lineup up here. Um, you may never stand in a pulpit. You, you may never uh, lead a class. You, you might never do anything like that. But God has equipped every person in the body of Christ with a ministry. Uh, the New Testament says we are all able ministers of the New Testament. Uh, but this thing called ministry, ministering in the body of Christ, ministering to one another and ministering to those that are coming into the church, those that are still not born again. To have a ministry, uh, you have to have a breaking in your life. And that's what Pastor wants to talk to you about for a few uh, minutes. If, if you look in the Word of God, you get this sense from the people of God. And it, it seems like it's a downer. It seems like they're talking uh, negatively about themselves. But they're not. They're being uh, more honest than secular people, perhaps. Psalm 6, verse 2. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Somebody say, I am weak. And we sing that in some of the songs that we sing. Uh, we, we sing, you know, I am weak and thou art strong. The psalmist said, heal me for my bones are vexed. He said, I, I go through situations that I don't understand. I'm vexed by them and, and I feel weak, God, and I need your mercy. And then in the New Testament, Matthew uh, chapter 26, Jesus actually addressed his disciples in the garden and he said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And he hits the issue head on. He said, your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. Uh, how many have lived for God long enough to figure that out? That you've got a spirit that really wants to do great things for God and wants to be on top of it for God, but you've got flesh that uh, doesn't get enough sleep. You've got flesh that has bad moods. Uh, you've got flesh that's just whatever. It's, it's flesh. And so the flesh is weak. And so you get this honest sense from the people of God in the word of God that we're not trying to gloss it over and pretend we're perfect and pretend we don't have any issues, we willingly admit that sometimes we feel very weak. And uh, one, one time Jesus was discussing with a group of people, uh, the, the John the Baptist, he was discussing uh, him with this group of people. And here's what Jesus' evaluation of John the Baptist was. Luke 7, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist would have not have seen himself that way. In fact, uh, Jesus, when he speaks about John the Baptist, John the Baptist ends up thrown in prison and loses his life just for preaching about the coming Messiah. And, and so John the Baptist probably didn't feel very strong. Uh, he, he literally met his end at the hands of a wicked king. Uh, but Jesus said this also. He said, he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater, think about this, than the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Now we read that over. That's a familiar verse to us. But, but literally think about what Jesus is saying because some of us, sometimes we don't feel very strong, very mighty, very capable. We don't feel like we're doing very much for God. And, and we get this kind of uh, guilt complex, inferiority complex. And, and some of you, your, your self-talk isn't very good. You literally kind of say these things to yourself. I'm dumb and, and I'm stupid and, and I can't do much and, and whatever. And, and sometimes all of us feel those feelings. But Jesus has a great ego booster, if you want to call it that. He said, I don't care who you are. If you're in the kingdom of heaven, the least one, the weakest one, the smallest one, if you're in the kingdom of heaven, you have a relationship with God that is greater than the greatest prophet who ever lived 
in the Old Testament. Now, that's amazing to me. And that's how God looks at his family. Now, we have a, a unique generation of Christians out there today uh, because more than any other generation, I think we've tried to make God into our image. We try to create a Savior who's kind of like our buddy in the sky. And, uh, you know, he comes when we call and, and uh, he does what we want and he answers every prayer we ever pray. And, and that's our, our image of the perfect God. And God defies us making him into our image. In fact, he's on a different kind of construction project. He actually wants to make us into his image. Um, and, and, and for some of these people today, uh, if you hear them talk or preach or teach, or uh, the, God's will for them always just seems to be exactly what their will is. That's God's will. And... Uh, God also never seems to be disturbed by the places where they are willfully, knowingly contradicting the word of God in their lifestyle, and, and, and yet God's not supposed to be upset by that. And, and so that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people who willfully uh, sin or are willfully rebellious or willfully ignore the plain, clear word of God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about people who sincerely, genuinely want to live for God. Because weakness is not willful, repeated sin. When, when, that's the cop out. Well, I'm just weak. That's why I sin every week. Every Tuesday night at 8, every Thursday night at 9. No, that's not weakness. That's willful, repeated sin. So I'm not talking about that. I, I, I'm not talking about people that, uh, you know, they, they think they've got God fooled. You know, they've got it pulled, the wool pulled over God's eyes. Because, you know, oh God, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. I, I did it again. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it. And they intended to do that. They planned it for months. It was in their calendar. That's not weakness. That's sin. So I'm not talking about that. If any of us are consistently, willfully, repeatedly making choices that are against the word and the will of God. That's not weakness. You're not a saint. You're a sinner and you need to deal with that. But if you are a child of God, sincerely trying to serve God, which I think would be uh, probably all of us, at least the vast majority of us here tonight, then this particular Bible study is dedicated to you. No matter how many times you have come up short, fallen, failed, made mistakes, felt inferior, felt like your life doesn't matter, felt like you tried to do something for God and messed it up, uh, this is for you tonight. Paul even said this in Romans 7. He said, for the good that I would, I do not. I, I have great intentions, but sometimes my flesh catches up with me. And he said, the evil which I would not, that I do. Now notice what he says. I didn't want to do the evil, but it crept up on me. I didn't want to make the mistake, but it crept up on me. He's not talking about planned, repeated, willful sin. He's talking about errors and mistakes. And, 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 and he said, I want to do so much more for God. I want to be so much more for God. I want to be good and great for God, but sometimes I head out for that direction and I don't get there. And that's why the words of Jesus in Matthew 12 that I'm about to read, they, they mean so much to many people in this room. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. Somebody that's bruised, somebody that has been damaged, somebody that's been hurt or wounded, God's not going to break them. He's going to minister to them. He's going to heal them. And a smoking flax, some, something that is, is trying to light, trying to catch on fire, but it's just not there. He's not going to stomp that out and quench it. He's going to blow the breath of his spirit on it. He's going to let it, it flame up into uh, a burning flame. So this is the picture in the word of God. Yes, if God was looking at us, he'd say, yes, you're weak. Yes, you mess up. Uh, yes, you have flesh to deal with. Yes, sometimes you don't meet your own good intentions. And yes, CCC, most of you have already forgotten and broken your New Year's resolutions, and we're not even through January yet. Right? 
Some of us have totally given up on New Year's resolutions. We just say, God, ditto for last year because we haven't done those yet. <laughs> Every one of us as people, we have weaknesses, and there's all kinds of weaknesses. There's all kinds of brokenness. We have uh, emotional weaknesses. We have relationship weaknesses. We have uh, some of us physical challenges that we work with, financial situations that we work with. Um, there, there's all kinds of weakness. There's intellectual weakness. Not all of us are the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, there, there are even fashion weaknesses for some of us. I'm guilty of that. I, I, I don't think I'm colorblind, uh, but I've learned uh, how to dress by watching Beverly's face. <laughs> I'll say, does this match? And she'll say, well, if she says that, it doesn't match. She's just trying not to offend me. Um, and so if you ever see me in something that looks hideous, it's because Beverly wasn't home. Um, we've all got different kinds of weaknesses. Um, the real issue for every Christian here, every church member, every apostolic believer is not, do I have weaknesses? If you're still asking, well, I don't know, Pastor. Do you, I, I wonder if I've got weaknesses. If you're still asking that question, um, this is not for you. You just go on in oblivion, okay? But for the rest of us, it's not, do I have weaknesses? It's, what in the world am I going to do about my weaknesses? What am I going to do with all the weaknesses that I seem to have? And what people normally do in the world, and it's bled over into the church, is we deny our weaknesses, and we defend, our, oh, that's a big one, we defend our weaknesses, and we make excuses for them. Some of us, we resent that we're weak in those areas. And, and most of all, we try to hide our weaknesses because we don't want anybody to see that we've got weaknesses. And then God comes along to every one of us at some point in our life, and he says, you know what I want to do about your weaknesses? I don't want you to resent them. I don't want you to hide them. I don't want you to make excuses for them. In fact, what God would say to every one of us is, I want to take your weaknesses. And this is one of the most counterintuitive things about living for God. I want to take your weaknesses, and I want to use them for my glory. And we go, that's impossible. But that's what God does with everybody. Um, we think God only wants to use our strengths. But when we bring our strengths to the table... We're all strong in different areas, and if, if, if we start comparing our strengths, all we create is competition. Uh, he's better at that. She's better at that. When, when we bring our strengths to the table and all we ever share and all we ever use and all we ever talk about is our strengths, all we do is make everybody else feel inferior because we never compare our weaknesses with their weaknesses. A lot of times what we do is we hold up our strength and then we look at their weakness, don't we? And, and so uh, God says, I want to use not your strengths. I want to use your weaknesses, and I want to use them for my, my glory. And, and how can God do that? Well, here's how he can do it. Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't do this like the world does this. Uh, your ways are not my ways. Uh, says the Lord, as the heavens are higher above the earth, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So what God's saying is, I've got this figured out that I can actually uh, do something that you would probably never choose to do, but I can take areas where you are weak. I'm not talking about sin, remember that. I, I, I'm talking about weak areas in our lives and, and, and God says, I can use those for my glory. Um, how many know that God is smarter than you are? Okay, we didn't get 100%, and that's dangerous, but, but we'll carry on. Um, the way we think God should work is sometimes the exact opposite of the way he does work in our lives. God says, I don't want to work around your weaknesses. I, I don't even want to work in spite of your weaknesses. I want to work through your weaknesses. Areas where you don't have it together, I want to take those areas and I want the, the way I'm working on those in your life, I want that to be a message, I want that to be a blessing and I want that to create a ministry to other people. And, and we never see that one coming. We think God's going to use our great strengths and all of our spiritual giftings and we think God's going to use all the things that we're kind of secretly quite content and maybe even proud about that. Well, I can do that. I'm really good at that. So that's where God's going to use me. And, and, 
And 99 times out of 100, that's not the area God uses in your life to be a major blessing to everybody else. He uses areas where you're weak and he turns those into a strength and then he uses that to bless everybody and we don't even see it coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, Paul writes these words. He says, uh, this, this might not be helpful to your self-esteem. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Somebody say, that's us. God has chosen the weak things, there's that word, the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and base things of the world, things which are despised as God chosen, yea, and even things which are not, things that don't have really any value in the eyes of the world, things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Why does God do that? Why does God persist in reaching into our lives and putting his hand on areas where we don't have it together and using areas where we don't? Don't have it together to be a blessing to somebody else. Why does he do that? Here's why. That no flesh should glory in his presence. That's why he does it. Because if we just go around feeling quite happy that God's converted us, he saved us, we're in his family, we've got all these wonderful strengths and power, and, and we get thinking about that, uh, we don't give him the glory. We kind of give us the glory. Um, th this thing called ministry and, and uh, ministry is such a wide, broad word in the Word of God. Because, again, everybody has a ministry. It's not just people that stand in pulpits that have ministry. Everybody has a ministry. And that word is, is so wide uh, in its meaning in the Word of God. But, but sometimes in North America, we focus on the, the very public, prominent aspects of ministry. Let me tell you about ministry. I, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but our Wednesday night crowd has been shrinking. Has anybody noticed that? You know why it's shrinking? Because people are engaged in ministry that aren't even on our campus tonight. They're in different parts of the city, and they're engaged in reaching and winning and teaching and discipling people, and I think it's wonderful. Um, and, and uh, so if you look around and you think, my goodness, Wednesday night, I think it used to be bigger. Yes, it did in here, but it's now bigger because of everything else than it was before. Does that make sense? And, and so that's ministry. We, we think it's ministry when pastor gets up and he starts to preach or teach or somebody gets up here and they're, you know, somehow anointed, we think. Ministry is what we're doing to further the kingdom of God. And what some of you precious people do every week where nobody else sees it, that's ministry. Thank God we've got prayer warriors and we don't have to parade them in front of the whole church and brag on their gifting every week uh, to get them to pray. They just pray. They, they don't have to have the pulpit, the spotlight. They don't have to have any of that. Um, so, so God does this that no flesh should glory in his presence. God purposely, on purpose, intentionally works through weak people because it shows his power instead of our power. So here's what you got to learn about the God you serve. He's not impressed with human strength. You are. He's not. God's not impressed when human beings power up and they're real strong and they got it all together. That impresses us. That doesn't impress God in the least. God is impressed when somebody humbles themselves and when somebody knows they don't have it together and when somebody goes to God on their face in prayer and says, God, I can't do this. This isn't working. You've got to help me. God's impressed with that. Zechariah chapter 4, famous scripture. We quote it all the time. We sing it. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. None of the work of God gets done by human beings powering up and doing something that's very strong in the human sense. The work of God always gets done by people who know that they've got weaknesses. And I think that's good news. Maybe not to you. Maybe you've got your act all together, but that's really good news to me because um, most of us are not extraordinary people. Uh, nobody's been lining up for your autograph this week. Um, some of us, we, we don't have extraordinary uh, personalities. We're just normal. We're just ordinary. We're just average. And God says, that's okay because I choose to work through supernatural strength, not natural strength. Uh, that, that's why 
uh, we have to be conscious of this all the time. God says, I choose to work through natural weakness so that supernatural power can shine through. Now, again, when I talk about weakness, I'm not talking about uh, sins. I'm not even talking about character flaws that you can change. Uh, God is not uh, sitting up in heaven thinking that ah, you go. Uh, girl, you're so impatient, you rage at everybody, you go. That's not a weakness. That's a character flaw. Uh, God is not sitting up in heaven saying, have that seventh piece of pie. You don't need any self-discipline. That's a weakness. No, that's not a weakness. That's Well, you may have a weakness for pie, but that's a character flaw. Greed and laziness and all those kind of things. That's not something that God, uh, because those are against his word and against his principle. So what's a weakness? If it's, if it's not a sin and if it's not something that's kind of willful uh, like that, what, what is it? A weakness is a limitation. Everybody say, a limitation. A weakness is a limitation in your life. And you either inherited it from uh, your life circumstances or it's something that has come into your life and you can't change it. You would if you could. Um, and, and this can be a number of things. Everybody say, limitation. So if you've ever felt like I'm so limited, I wish I could do more, I wish I could be more, uh, but you're limited. And, and uh, as we get older, uh, some of our senior saints, I've had wonderful, uh, very kind of almost emotional conversations with some of them because as they get older, um, they find that physically they can't do what they would like to do. And then there's some people that are born with physical challenges or physical defects and, and they face that all their life. And for some of us, there's external circumstances that we can't control. Sometimes there's unexpected financial setbacks or unexpected uh, issues in life. Uh, and that's why our heart goes out to people that encounter a trauma or a crisis because we, we just have a good sense as a human being of what that's like. But for some people in our church, and you would not know who they are because, uh, you know, they're worshiping and smiling and they're shaking your hand, but some of our folks have unbelievable relationship pressures within their families. Uh, some people in our congregation, their families don't like that they're part of our congregation. They don't want them to be a Christian. They don't want them to be a Pentecostal. And, and you know, we think everybody likes us, but not everybody likes us. That's a revelation. Some of us do have emotional tendencies that we're predisposed towards. Some people, they struggle with depression or they struggle with anxiety or whatever. And, and then some of us, uh, we look at other people and, you know, some talents are just completely beyond our ability. Uh, God did not. I don't know why he didn't, but it's his business and I'm good with it. He didn't create everybody to be a singer. Some of you, he created kind of as a, an anti-singer. Uh, when you sing, it ministers to animals that can hear those high, shrill pitches that no human. <laughs> and you know what? That's why the scripture didn't say make a joyful song unto the Lord. Make a joyful tune unto the Lord. Make an on-key performance unto the Lord. The Bible just says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And I know some people that can really fulfill the word of God. And sometimes people look at other people because the devil likes to work at this because he likes to drive a wedge between us and other people. Or he even likes to dry, uh, dry, uh, push a wedge between what we should be thinking and what we are thinking about ourselves. And so the devil, sometimes he tries to beat up on us and, and, and he'll, he'll remind us what we can't do. You're no good at that. Uh, you, you, you can't do that. Uh, that person has that gifting and that ability and that talent. And so they're so valuable. And because we are inundated with a celebrity culture today, um, sometimes we come to church and, and literally people think that somebody that has a microphone in their hand, that they're more valuable than everybody that's not got a microphone in their hand. The preacher, the soloist, the singer... Uh, that's crazy. That's just a different talent or a different gifting or a different 
office, that has nothing to do with your value as a minister of the New Testament because we are all able ministers of the New Testament. Some of the most valuable people in our church, you will never, ever, 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 ever uh, see them up in the pulpit uh, teaching or preaching. But if they, we didn't have the prayer cover... The, the, you know, when, when you think about military assaults in the modern age, you, you've read this in the media. You know, they, they go to attack and, and they fly the, uh, the air attack first because they, they'd soften everything up on the ground, literally. Uh, prayer power, prayer cover is the aerial assault of the church. And before we ever get to service and before the, the singers ever stand up here in, in the line and they pick up the microphones and they begin to sing or before Pastor or Pastor Jack ever gets here and they open their mouth to say the first word of a sermon, somebody has prayed and they've put prayer cover over our church and prayer cover over our pastors and prayer cover over our services and that is so incredibly Valuable. You talk about ministry, that's how an apostolic church survives and thrives in an era like we live in. And that's incredibly valuable. Um, I, I'm not going to be much longer, but I wish you'd just lift up your hands for a minute because I do want this to, to soak in somehow. Uh, I'm not asking you to pray anything right now, but would you just worship Jesus for a minute? Uh, because... That helps us. That helps the word of God to, to find root if we just uh, have it in a climate of, of prayer and, and worship and thanksgiving to God. Jesus, I pray that you would minister to some precious saint that is struggling tonight. I pray that you'd minister to some precious believer, some member of our church that they don't feel very valuable or significant or even strong. And I pray, Jesus, in your name that you would minister strength and healing and understanding to them. The understanding may be the thing that, that helps them to get through a, a, a part of their life. I pray, Jesus, that you'd minister. Right now, I speak it in the name of Jesus. Right now, I speak it in the name of Jesus. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. This is one of the most frustrating things about living for God. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 4, and he uses this incredible image. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? So the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God is not interested in how puffed up our egos can get because we think we did a good job or we think that somebody benefited from our ministry. Uh, the thing about clay pots is that they break very easily. Uh, they're not indestructible. The thing about clay pots is that every clay vessel has inherited design flaws. They're all unique. They're not poured in a mold. They're not made in a factory. They're, they're handmade. And they all have little uniquenesses and, and design flaws and little imperfections. And Paul's lesson there is we are just ordinary containers, but we contain the indestructible power of God. So, so sometimes going through life, our little clay vessel, it gets hurt, it gets bruised, it gets scratched, it gets damaged. One lady even wrote a book said, God uses cracked pots. And I think she was right. <laughs> and, and, and for all of us, that means we are the kind of person that God can use. We have this great treasure, it's in an earthen vessel. If you could learn this, the next time you face one of your limitations, everybody say limitations. The next time you face some area where you think, I'm broken, this isn't working, I'm not doing this very well. Uh, when you face your own human brokenness, I, I wish you could look at it this way. God created you that way so that you would not rely on your strength, on your intelligence, on your talent, on your ability, on your gifting. God created you that way so you could rely not on the vessel, not on the outside, not on what everybody else sees or interacts with, but so you could learn to interact uh, and, and to rely on the treasure that is within you. 
Uh, there, there are people in the church of the living God that, that their physical presence isn't very um, uh, formidable. It's not very powerful. It's, it's not something that you go, oh, my goodness. You know, we're, we're kind of in the presence of somebody that has it all together. Uh, I was writing a report for Global Missions today, and I was summarizing uh, th this last year. And one of the highlights of my not just my year, one of the highlights of my life was being able to go to Brazil this year and spend a few days with brother and sister Benny de Merchant, who uh, this uh, September, October, will have been in Manaus for 50 years doing the work of God. And uh, I imagine everybody here lives in a nicer home than those great missionaries live in in Manaus, a very humble, plain home. Uh, I imagine everybody here, uh, they probably would have uh, more financial, uh, everything they get goes back into the work of God. I imagine we've all probably uh, looked after our retirement uh, in, in some way. Even those of us that, that might not have a whole lot, uh, th they just keep piling everything back into the work of God. And uh, to be around them felt like walking in the presence of giants. Um, just so plain and so ordinary and so humble and so self-effacing. And when you're with Benny de Merchant, you feel like you're with a New Brunswick potato farmer because that's what he was. And he's just plain and ordinary. But when he steps into his role as the leader of that great work in Brazil, which is mammoth, uh, by anybody's stretch of the imagination. It's, it, it's, it's breathtaking. Every night there was a, a choir of hundreds from different parts of that district. We were in one district. Uh, I, I was writing it all down again today. Uh, 141 Bible school graduates one weekend. 100 new ministers one weekend. 136 received the Holy Ghost one weekend. It's just uh, this powerful, powerful national church. And yet... Um, they would be the first ones to tell you that they don't have a whole lot of strength. Um, that's the kind of people God uses mightily. And when we get us out of the way, uh, God can use us even, even more. Um, the Bible doesn't just tell us to admit our weaknesses. And this is where uh, probably we all struggle. It's one thing to admit our weaknesses. We can kind of grumble to each other. Well, yeah, I'm weak here, and I, I, don't, I, I can't get this together. But the Bible doesn't just say to admit our weaknesses. The Bible actually tells us to be thankful for our weaknesses. It literally teaches us to give God thanks in the middle of all of our weaknesses. And we don't like that because we really want to come to church and take a magic pill and get rid of all of our problems and all of our weaknesses, and we don't have any magic pills here. Uh, and we come to church and when the Bible kind of leans that way and says we should be grateful, uh, our reaction is, I don't want to be grateful for all the things I'm not good at. And I don't want to be grateful for all the areas I'm weak in. And I don't want to be grateful for all the issues and problems and struggles I have. In fact, I come to church so I can be free of all that. I'm sitting around waiting for the one sermon and the one song and the one service and the one altar call where God finally delivers me from all that. Well, I'll tell you when that's going to be. That's going to be your funeral. And God will deliver you from all of it. But, but the alternative is better. Just keep living for God despite your weaknesses and your circumstances and your problems because uh, there's no magic service or magic song or magic sermon that's going to deliver you from all of your struggles. But the good news for the people of God is not just that God works in spite of our weaknesses and in spite of our problems and in spite of our brokenness. It's not just that. He works through our weaknesses and through our problems and and through our brokenness, and that's the real miracle of living for God as a human being. Um, why in the world would anybody want to be thankful uh, for their weaknesses? Well, there, there's blessings to weaknesses. Uh, weaknesses can be a blessing in disguise. They keep you humble. They keep you from competing with your brothers and sisters. Weaknesses guarantee God's help because God helps those that are contrite, those that are broken. Uh, Paul had this little prayer meeting, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
Um, he had this thorn in the flesh. People think it was this debilitating eye condition because he, he said in one place, see how large these letters are. I'm writing them with my own hand. So some people think his thorn in the flesh was uh, a big eye condition. Some people think that he had uh, some kind of, of seizures. Uh, some people think he had other issues. Some people, uh, theologians, just think that he had a lot of physical problems because he'd been shipwrecked, left for dead, beaten, thrown in prison. Uh, you know, that, that would kind of mess you up after. After a while, you know, it wouldn't be arthritis. It could be like a wound from a beating or, you know, being stoned to death and left for dead. That, that can do some damage. And so some people think it was that. There's a, a small little portion of Bible scholars that think Paul's thorn in the flesh was a mean mother-in-law. For, for real. Um, for real. Uh, I don't know what his thorn in the flesh was, but here's what I know about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Three times he went to God and he said, the great apostle said, I'm tired of the weakness. I'm tired of the brokenness. I'm tired of, of feeling like I, I don't have strength. I'm tired of feeling like, you know, th this is this lifelong prayer request and God, I'm tired of my prayer not being answered. Here's what he said, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Uh, God said to Paul, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, here it is. Don't miss it. For my strength, this is God talking, my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength isn't made perfect in your strength. That's where your strength shines. And everybody goes away saying, look how cool that guy is. Look how together she has it. L look how strong they are. Look at what a good saint they are. Look at what a great preacher he is. That's where our strength shines through. God says, my strength isn't made perfect in your strength. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And, and we don't like that. I'm not even sure we do really well dealing with that. But God, that's his word. That's what he said to the great apostle Paul. Uh, he said, Paul, when, when you're weak, when you can't do it, when you feel like you're overwhelmed, that's when my strength comes through and it's made perfect in your weakness. And so finally here in uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul seems to get it. He says, so most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities... And, and I'll talk about where I'm weak so the power of Christ may rest upon me. In fact, I'll take pleasure in infirmities, pleasure in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. And he gets it. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I, I don't know who it is tonight. Um, pastoring, teaching Bible study, preaching is kind of working blind sometimes. I, I don't know who it is that's really wrestled with this maybe the last few days or this week or this month or since the first of the year because everybody else has got these big impressive New Year's resolutions and they're, they're going to, you know, uh, lose 50 pounds, fit into their uh, high school clothes, uh, run the marathon, uh, scale Mount Everest and get it all done by the, by Sunday. And, 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 they're not going to do that, but they're talking about it. And, and maybe you feel like, you know what? I look at everybody else and I feel so, so weak, so inferior, so less than. And uh, Paul got it. He said, when I'm weak, when I feel like I can't do much for God, when I feel like my problems disqualify me, when I feel like the mistakes I've made and the weaknesses I have and my life circumstances. Some of us, we feel like our life circumstances are kind of a billboard and, 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 and the, the billboard says to everybody, just stay away, damaged goods, uh, never going to amount to much. That is not true in the church of the living God. In fact, if you could take down the mask that we all wear, that's our North American mask. If you could take down that mask, every one of us, we have very similar struggles, very similar issues. We all feel that way. And God says, would you, would you people get a grip 
I'm not looking for you to be perfect. I'm not looking for you to be strong. I'm not looking for you to be mighty. I'm not looking for you to have it all together. In fact, I'm looking for you to say, God, I'm weak. God, I don't have it all together. God, I've got this issue and I've got that circumstance. And God, I don't understand why you haven't answered this prayer. And God, sometimes I feel like I'm wearing a big sign saying, keep out, keep away, because I'm damaged goods. I've had so many problems, so many mistakes, and I'll never be what I could have been for God. And God's saying, get a grip. That's not the way I look at my church. Oh, my strength, my grace, my power is made perfect in your weakness. I'm not looking for anybody to run the aisle. If you do, we'll probably wonder about you. But I think the quietness in the room tonight maybe is the loudest. Amen. Being thankful for our weaknesses instead of fighting against them and chafing against them and actually thanking God in the middle of some of the things we face some of the things we can't do, some of the areas where we lack strength, it confuses the devil to bits. Here we are, we've got all these issues and weaknesses and we're thanking God in the middle of it. See, a church works like this. When you make a strong rope, you, you don't make it by one solid cord. You make it by a lot of strands entwined together. Any one of those little strands alone couldn't do the job, but when you entwine all those strands, you make a strong rope. That's the church of the living God. Not one of us has to be gifted enough or anointed enough or powerful enough to, to do what we're supposed to do here. But together, we all entwine as strands in the family of God. And you know what? Some weeks, some of those strands are pretty weak, but it doesn't matter because they're entwined with the rest of the rope called the family of God and the church of the living God. And so the rope still gets the job done, even though one of the strands is, is weak this week. That's the value of unity. That's the value of a church family. We're all weak in different ways. We're all weak at different times, but together we are strong. And when we admit our weaknesses and when we admit where we don't have it all together and we're not trying to just put on airs and impress everybody, we get to be strong together. And that's important. So let me close. Paul said in Romans 14 and 1, Him that is weak in the faith, you receive them. But don't receive them to doubtful disputations. Don't receive them so you can correct them and advise them and improve them. Just receive them. Because if you could turn around in the mirror, you'd figure out that some days it's you that's the weak one and you're the one that needs received. He says in Romans 15, very next chapter, we then that are strong, so if you're feeling strong today, we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not just please ourselves. This is all about being part of the family of God. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, who is weak and I'm not weak? Um, who is offended and I burn not? Paul said, we're family. We're God's body. So if one of us is hurting, if one of us is weak, really that's my responsibility too. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. I'm not going to be bragging to you about the sermon I preached or the gift I operated or, or, or the great accomplishment that I made for God. I'm going to tell you about my infirmities. That's the New Testament model. Because when we compare our strengths, we create competition. Sometimes we don't even voice it, but we just create competition. Sometimes we create jealousy. Sometimes we create tension. But anytime you open up and you're honest about areas where you're weak, you create sympathy. You create grace. You create help. There is nothing more powerful than somebody standing up and giving a personal testimony of where they were weak and God made them strong. Where they didn't have it together, but God turned their life around. There is nothing more powerful than that. And, and years ago, we, we used to do tes testimony services in church where I grew up. Many of you have been in those services. We don't really do those anymore. Somewhere along the way, I, I don't know if it was the 60s, somewhere along the ways, the crazies started coming to church, and testimony service got quite entertaining. Um, <laughs> And so we don't really do that anymore. But, but you know what? The place that your testimony matters the most isn't here anyway. Uh, you know, that, that we stand up and say, you know, thank the Lord for saving me. 
keep me, heal me, fill me, and I want to be ready when he comes. Plunk. Uh, that was testimony service in some of the, the, the churches, church services I was in. And that's valuable. I, I guess I am kind of making fun of that, but I'm not meaning to. But, but the place where your testimony is the most valuable isn't to all of us that already are on your team. We're all rooting for the same thing. We could all get up and say it in unison. unison you know, thank God for saving me, keeping me, healing me. I want to be ready when he comes. Plunk. We could all do that together in unison. But that's not where your testimony matters. Your testimony matters out there where somebody who is really weak and somebody who is really messed up needs to know that you're not feeling superior to them. You're just like them except you found Jesus. And so your weakness becomes this incredible strength and this incredible blessing and this incredible testimony. Um, Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I talk to people about my struggles because when I talk to people who were struggling about my struggles, I help them. I gain the weak. When I talk to people who were doubting about the doubts I had had, I gain them. I help them. When I talk to people who were going through a dark night of the soul about the time that I was going through a dark time and I didn't hardly know if God existed and it was really bad and it was really sad and I was really angry. When I talked to the doubting about my doubts, when I talked to those in the darkness about the times I'd felt like I was in darkness, I gained them, I helped them, I ministered to them. And so Paul said, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. He said, you, you know what, I'm just going to put my life on the line and be an open book and talk about everything. My struggles, my issues, my problems, my weaknesses. The greatest thing that weakness does for every single person in here is your weakness gives you your greatest, please hear pastor tonight, this is really what I came to say and the rest has been introduction, okay? The greatest thing that a weakness does for us is it gives us a ministry. And this is counterintuitive, and we don't even like it. And some pastors, like Pastor Raymond, were even uncomfortable with it. Because, you know, people can stray, even backslide, uh, and they can come back. And I don't like that as a pastor because I, I want to just kind of thunder down so nobody ever backslides. I want to dangle them over the flames every Sunday so nobody dares to backslide. But you know how powerful the grace of God is? That even somebody, and some of you are here tonight, um, even somebody that strays, backslides, gets away from God. Some of you have kids or grandchildren or maybe a spouse that they once served God and they're not serving God tonight. Um, the grace of God is so massive and so impressive that God can take the wrong that they've done, uh, years in some cases that they've wasted, and they come back and God can use that as a testimony. And it was a weakness. It was... It, it was, a, it was a, a wrong choice. It was a, a, a sinful choice even. And God can take that and, and he can turn that into a testimony that actually blesses somebody else. The devil never sees God coming. The devil thinks if he can mess you up, even for a little while in your life, that you'll never be able to do anything for God and nothing could be further from the truth because there's no sin so deep that the grace of God is not deeper still. There's no situation so bad that the grace of God can't get in and redeem it and turn it into a, a testimony of His glory. So the greatest thing that your weakness does for you, and I don't know what you've been thinking about uh, during this message, uh, I hope you've been thinking about your weakness. I hope you've been. <laughs> I hope you haven't been sitting there thinking, "Well, this doesn't apply to me. I don't have any weaknesses." <laughs> Please go home and talk to your spouse. Um, ask them about the message. They'll they'll explain the way to you more perfectly. The greatest thing that weakness does for us is it gives us our most powerful ministry, our weakness, where you cry out to God and say, I don't have it together.
together. Where you cry up to God and say, this is a struggle for me and I need your help. Those things in life give you your greatest ministry. Greatest ministry. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be a little vague here purposely. Uh, early on in my ministry, I faced a situation and uh, some precious, precious, precious things that uh, I had been taught and believed and were part of the fiber and the core of, of my being and who I was as a Christian and what I'd always been taught. They were viciously attacked and brutalized and lampooned and mocked. And uh, I wasn't here in Fredericton at the time. I was in St. John uh, assisting uh, Brother Goddard. And I remember Brother Goddard saying, those things are being attacked and they're being mocked and, and they're being just lampooned by, by people. And uh, Raymond, you, you're kind of like a teacher kind of personality, so why don't you go and, and study those things and then teach them to our church? And so I did. Brother Goddard was so kind to me. He, he didn't realize, I don't think, what he was doing. He not only gave uh, me time to study something that would be a strength to our local church in St. John, he gave me time to study something that would forever ground that and drill it deep in my spirit. And uh, I came out of those few weeks of study, um, not just believing what I had always been taught, but realizing that what I had always been taught was so grounded and so much part of the fiber of the word of God. That has been way too many years ago for me to admit to you. I can't remember. I'm old enough now that I get to forget stuff. And um, decades later, literally, um, I've been privileged around the world in different places to teach those same principles out of that moment of struggle, not only personally and in our churches and in our district, not only out of, out of that moment of struggle did something come that benefited me, but it's been something that God has uh, allowed me to, to, to use and to communicate um, to different people. Uh, different churches, even different countries. Sometimes the situations that you go through that you would never, ever choose, God uses them to turn around maybe years later and be a blessing to somebody else. I know that's, that's purposely vague. Um, be thankful for your weaknesses. Sounds stupid. Doesn't sound biblical, but it is. It guarantees God's help when you're thankful for your weaknesses. But more than that, it guarantees that you will value other people in the body of Christ when you are aware and thankful for your weaknesses. It teaches you to be in unity with your brothers and sisters. It teaches you that we're all strong together and we're all a disaster apart because we're meant to be family. The greatest thing that your weakness will do is it'll give you your deepest moments of ministry. Because God didn't put you on this earth just to live for yourself. He put you on this earth to live for other people. Your greatest ministry will flow out of your greatest weaknesses. Your greatest life message is going to come out of some of the things that hurt you the deepest. i got to stop there. I'm, I'm, I'm not very dramatic. I, 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 Pastor got all his hollering done on Sunday. Um, but the very thing that caused some of you the most grief and pain, God can use as a life message to other people to encourage them. The thing, this, this, is, this is the grace of God, the thing that you're most embarrassed about, the thing that you're most ashamed of, the thing you don't want anybody else to really talk about or think about, God can even use things like that to encourage and lift and bless other people. Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter of the Bible uh, in verse uh, 34, there's a little transition. It says, uh, all these mighty people, they quench the violence of fire and they escape the edge of the sword. But it says, out of weakness, they were made strong. Here's the principle of the word of God. God always uses weak people because he can turn weakness into strength. Pain, hurt, loss, grief, 
mistakes, embarrassments. They sensitize us to the hurts that other people face. And we're not going through life so selfishly and so self-centered. So if you want to have a Christ-like ministry, that means sometimes other people are going to be helped or encouraged or even healed by the wounds that you've experienced in your life. Think about it. Jesus suffered wounds at Calvary and we were healed and saved by those wounds. That's the principle. So the bottom line of this simple little lesson tonight is this. Stop using your weakness as an excuse why you can't do anything for God. Stop using your weakness as an excuse to feel inferior. Stop using your weakness as, 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 as some kind of uh, you know crutch or prop. Well, I can't do that. I'm not valuable. Your weakness may be the very thing God wants to use in your life to bring glory to himself. Paul said in Philippians 4, I can do all things things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I'm weak, but I've got his strength. I'm just a clay vessel, but I've got his treasure inside. Last scripture, Isaiah chapter 40. You know this one. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, God increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. Not because they embarked on any great program of self-discipline. That's good, but that's not what they did. They waited on God and he renewed their strength. And, and then Isaiah says, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. This is all about weak people, weary people, people who are fainting and falling. But when they turn all of that over to God, God renews their strength and he uses what they've walked through to bless others. A little quote I read years ago, it's never ever escaped my mind. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon their knees the least in the kingdom of heaven, the least at CCC, is greater than the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Your weakness is not uh, the devil having been given permission to wreck your life. Your weakness is actually something that God has permitted in your life to ultimately bring him glory. I hope that's a little bit of an encouragement to a people that I love, and that's this wonderful church. Um, some of you saints... I'm glad you're not all puffed up with pride thinking you're so great. But we could use a good dose not of self-esteem but of God-esteem. God didn't create us uh, just so we could just kind of be nothing. He created us to be something for him. But the way he makes something out of us is not the way we would choose to make something out of us. Um, would you lift up your hands and would you pray with Pastor one more time? I, I know this is kind of low key tonight, but it was meant to be. And I really feel like somebody's here that needs this. Um, so if you'd lift up your hands for a minute, and let's pray right now. And if you can just kind of let your voice out, and just create a little bit of a, a tapestry of prayer here. We want God to be able to do and speak the way he wants to right now. I love you, Jesus. I pray that you would lift up and encourage and help and heal the precious, beautiful people of God. I pray, Jesus, for uh, people that the devil, he, he attacks them all the time and says they don't matter and they're not loved and they don't belong and they don't fit. I, I pray, Jesus, that in the middle of all of that, you would give them a little glimpse of your word, what you see about them, that through their weakness, you bring strength and through their pain, you actually bring healing. And, and through their circumstances, God, you can bring a, such a testimony of deliverance to other people. Jesus, I pray that you would minister right now in your name. I love you, Jesus. 
Eroto le belia su saman ya kutiara asia sabu. Sota re rebutio saman. It's beautiful, folks. Would you just keep praying? If you feel to stand in the presence of God, that would be a wonderful thing. I think somebody just needs to just stretch your arms toward the heavens and let God touch you tonight. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. So della baletta or coriassa samba. Ryan, come on back and play some for us if you will. So della baleba diosa samba. The toro curebe diosa. Lotta la bale su sabareba chi on della bassa. E dora badietto la bassia samba. Lotta la balessio, Sabbath, Mr. Sabbath. 